Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you, T. Hodge, and all the organisers for inviting me. Um, I'm Rachel Kent, and I'm a PhD okay. student at King's College. Um, and my research interests are situated around digital health technologies and self-representation via social media. So I'm going to talk today um, mainly about actually my... Sorry? Oh, oh, thank you. Um, about uh, my project, but I'm working within a wider project called Ego Media, so I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of what that is. Um, and then provide a bit of context around the kind of main theories um, and my research interests around mobile lives, how that influences self-representation. Um, biopolitics and the influence on digital health practice. Um, and then a brief uh, overview of my methodology as it stands at the moment. It's still very much a work in progress, so I am really, really interested in getting feedback um, from everybody and their ideas around that. And then just some initial discussion around my pilot interviews and my initial findings. So I'm working as part of a European Research Council funded project called Ego Media, and this is looking at how. Um, the impact of new media on forms and practices of self-presentation. Um, it's a very interdisciplinary project. Um, it's exploring very widely the influence of autobiography via social media and life writing. Um, the group in itself is from many different disciplinary backgrounds, including English literature, medical and digital humanities, media and communication studies. Um, and we're asking lots of questions around how social media is influencing communication practices and the effect the digital world is actually having on our feelings, our sense of being and well-being. So where my project sits within that, I'm really interested in looking at how um, users' life worlds are actually being contributed to, the autobiographical narratives, from a health perspective um, on, on, on and offline identity construction. So I'm not actually interested in exploring how patients with chronic illnesses or those trying to lose weight or train for a marathon um, are actually presenting their health practices. My interests lie in the everyday person and how lay people are using social media to present their health practice with consideration to this idea of a real or imagined community and how, if, and how with consideration to that community, if that actually affects health practice offline. So to provide a little bit more context, I'm very much interested in looking at this idea of mobile lives and social media and how that's influencing how we're presenting ourselves. So existing within this flexible and fluid membrane between the real and the virtual, we understand how network technologies mediate privatised and public social and communicative interactions and constructions of the self are now increasingly mediated through these digital forms and obviously the participatory and sharing affordances of social media and online communities. And as we've heard this morning, the mobile technologies that we're using mediate these emotional and social interactions, and this is constantly changing and will continue to change the relationship between humans and their technical devices, as well as altering modes of how we're actually communicating and interacting with one another. Elliot and Yuri argue that the rise of an intensely mobile society reshapes the self, its everyday activities, interpersonal relations, as well as connections with the wider world. And so we understand how identity formation now and conceptualizations of the self are being reformed through these digital modes and through these paradigms of mobility. So alongside the rise of mobile technology, we've seen the uptake of digital health technology and social media, as we've discussed this morning. And these converged platforms are enabling different forms of health self-representation. And they're also extending self-monitoring and surveillance into digitally quantifiable formats. And much of the literature, the current literature, which surrounds digital health technologies, really celebrates these practices as being very emancipatory, with the ability to revolutionise healthcare through self-knowledge. And whereas lifestyle used to be concerned with these traditional identities, conceptualisations of the self are now identifiable, identifiable by signs and self-representations of consumption. And so in neoliberal societies, as we've discussed this morning, consumption is a reflexive one, whereby it's equated with participation. And so my interest is looking at health as not an opposite to ill health, as being in good or ill health, but being representative of lifestyle choice. An involvement to rate the, the right consumptive choice positions the citizen as a consumer as actively making right ethical decisions, moral decisions for the management of their individual health self-care. So I'm very much contextualising and identifying health practice as evolving from health promotion strategies post the birth of the National Health Service, the public welfare state, the inclusive and support state, towards today's neoliberal practices of individualised and self responsabilizing health care. As we know, users are gathering a huge amount of data about their body and their health, and this raises a lot of questions about how helpful that is in terms of individual self-surveillance and, and health management. And so my questions that I'm asking is how do social media and digital health technology actually influence health misinformation, information, and on and offline health practice? 
We understand that digital health practices and affordances of self-quantifying devices have dimensions of both self-surveillance and wider surveillance, and the quantified self-movement is a key demonstration of this neoliberal self-management and self-surveillance practice. And so my research is identifying with biopolitics as a regulatory ideology in which individuals are incited and encouraged to become new active consumers of healthcare, taking personal responsibility and education to maintain individual self-care. The new active consumer of health is expected to take personal responsibility and educate themselves to maintain this healthcare. And this operates through a social control and a deep anxiety of becoming, becoming increasingly articulated through responsabilisation and an othering. So this othering of oneself is the differentiation of one body type, one citizen from another. And this is a dominant discourse within biopolitics and within the competitive and comparative strategies enabled by self-tracking and social media as well. And so to adhere to citizenship responsibilities of good health and good morality is so not to be a burden to the state, to deliver one's, differ oneself as a belonging citizen. And this manifests through risk calculation of socioeconomic groups, but is actually problematised often at an individual level through this identity maintenance and acted through attribution, attribution sorry, of citizen rights and obligations. So we understand biomedia as tools enabling the body visible through biotechnological information, but the ethical implications of the choice architecture of actually these different biomedia and digital health technologies needs interrogation in consideration to the influence of the regulatory and self-policing of the body. I'm identifying with both the technology and the individual user as agents, coexisting and in some cases co-evolving together. So in this regard, we understand biopolitics as being enacted and operating on two levels within practices of governmentality, individual and state. And that's where my research is hoping to step in to try and understand these two levels, the mediation between the relationship between personal usage and practices, as well as recognising the technology and the state as a as an agent and a choice architect of biopolitical rationalities. So I'm just going to briefly cover my methodology as it stands at the moment. Um, I'm going to be doing a selection of online data capture, and this is going to be screenshots from people's Facebook and Instagram usage, um, and then using reflexive guided diaries um, to tease out the kind of mundane and common sense reflections that users um, are getting from their online content sharing, and then try and contextualise that with interviews. So to discuss a little bit more in detail about my kind of initial uh, findings from my pilot interviews, I've been looking at self-representation and community practice and community surveillance and how that's influencing health presentation. And we understand that social media enables tools for self-presentation and identity management, which includes issues of identity and identification. And so the functions and affordability of social media and digital health technology enables both this self-presentation and performance of the self, as outlined um, by Goffman. I'm interested in how people are presenting themselves, posing it as a performance. And so when we're exploring the increased uptake and usage of participatory media, it's important to understand how this shift with users communicating one another is affecting the audience feedback and then the information then sh they are then sharing. We understand that historically rep representations were made by a set of people, for example, curators or filmmakers. And with the social media, we are the curator and the subject. We are subjectifying ourselves. Van Dyke likens this construction of online personas as the construction of personal brands. Promoting and branding of the self has become a normalized, accepted phenomena in every, everyday people's lives. And so we can understand this um, new shift towards interactions online as a form of self-branding and, com and commodification of social ties. So my research is interested in how platform features and affordances sculpt and shape personal identity. For example, Facebook makes explicit links between memory and emotion through these narrative, biographical, socio-technological affordances. And these fragmented data representation of the, representations of the self construct not only an online identity for the user, but also a health self, a construction of a health identity which they desire uh, others within the community to perceive. So how much does surveillance of others actually influence consideration to our own self-presentation? Um, users' the perception and management of their own visibility online is tied to shiftings and shifting understandings of what we consider public and private information. And online communities, as Daniel Trottier speaks about in his work around surveillance and social media, it's reorganising relations between peers and peer relations are becoming ever more surveillant in nature. 
So when we're considering the process and implications behind this, we need to look at surveillance and data and privacy within these online networks and how that's also influencing and mediates these self-representational practices. We understand now that the context collapse that's occurring online and how audiences of this self-representational data is including friends and family, colleagues, past, present, potentially future. And we need to recognise that role of context collapse and how that's affecting what we're sharing online. And I think it's arguable that social media users are actually increasingly conscious and aware of what is public and private online. And when we're conceptualising self-surveillance through self-representation, we can understand it with consideration to the participatory audiences and alongside this performance and presentation of the self. So we understand self-presentation in neoliberal age as being achieved through individualising practices and sharing of those facts and statistics. And the fastest growing segment of that is human biology related data. And when I spoke to one of my participants, I questioned what information they were sharing online. They responded by saying, the trend of sharing is growing. I guess it's the social thing that I don't have any close friends running a marathon anytime soon, but there's a large community of people out there that are doing it and respond to what I've done. So it's a nice feeling when somebody else comments and says, oh, I've run 60 miles this weekend too. So immediately here we can identify how other people's accounts is affecting your own health practice and how community surveillance evolves with self-representation and the construction enabled through the different technological affordances that are available, but also in consideration to this imagined or real peer surveillance. And so the motivation here is the sense of accomplishment from this user. And this may be returned by the wider community, but only once that information is shared. And so the representation of that data and the sharing of that content has a weight and a significance in, additional to, in addition to that personal self-gratification, which is then reinforced through the surveillance and feedback from the community. So I think we need to explore social media's impact upon sociality and communication practices in how it affects our sense of self. Is there an over-reliance on virtual support? And how much do other people's accounts affect your own health practice? When questioned, on the, <clears throat> excuse me, when questioned on the influence of community feedback, another participant responded by saying, I had a situation where I was with someone at the weekend and I went for a run. They came back and didn't post anything, and somebody asked me, didn't you go for a run this weekend? So that was interesting, because I just forgot to post it. And when I spoke to this um, participant as we continued the interview, he, I asked him, did this person feed back to the information they were always sharing? Were they liking? Were they commenting? And they just responded by saying that they had never fed back publicly towards this participant. This was something that they had just obviously been privately viewing but not publicly feeding back and had actually gone onto Facebook and sent him a private message to ask him whether he'd been for a run, <laughs> which I found quite interesting. Um, an interesting uh, practice in terms of how we're viewing other people but privately viewing and not publicly feeding back. So I then questioned this participant and I, I asked how is then this then going to make him feel more inclined to share your health practice for the future now that you, you know you have an imagined community who aren't publicly giving you, you the feedback, but you know are actually viewing it there? And so this raises a lot of questions in terms of how does imagined peer surveillance and community feedback influence or encourage active privatised self-censoring or exposure of certain health information in this construction and self-representation of health and the idealised self? So from here, we can see how that the gaze of others may increase pressures to respond to the choice architecture and nudges within the, the design of these applications. This user the following weekend might feel that he should go for a run because he knows that person wants to view it online. And it's arguable that having increased self-knowledge through these applications then increases this individual reflexivity, which is embedded with these kind of normative framings of choice. So self-surveillance and self-management um, and the presentation online becomes this kind of individualised, pressured cycle um, of standardised meritocracy where we're further enhancing the need for self-knowledge, but also the need for the feedback and the, the perception of the real or imagined community. So on an individual level, I'm really interested in looking at how people are self-representing, but for themselves. And we understand that users are engaging with these platforms and devices and willingly giving up all this personal data and information. But we, I'm interested in understanding why. What, what, why are we sharing this information? What are we getting back from the community? But what are we actually also just doing for our sense of self? What's all this acquisition of, acquisition of data doing for us? And we understand there's a very seductive nature of these technologies, the promise of connectivity, health optimization, community support and advice. And this leads us to consider what is actually important about self-tracking and this acquisition of data 
is how it's actually transforming how we understand the world. How is it providing information and misinformation to the corporations or state who resell or remarket this information back to us or to third parties and who then use this contact, content um, towards us, but how this cycle is influencing how we're practicing health management and self-representation and the choice architecture of these, of these devices. <clears throat> so there's two kind of ways of looking at this that we've touched on earlier this morning, but firstly the kind of more utopian side, if you like, that Beto argues about being able to individually monitor um, we are liberating ourselves, we are gaining control over our, over, over our lives. Similarly, Hayes argues that we are, through this, um, in, through this empowerment and acquisition of data and self-tracking, we're able to do this without becoming a projected unified subject of, of regimes of states and corporations. Um, but this is quite a limited view and doesn't actually take into consideration this governance of the soul and the extension of neoliberal controlling rationalities and the moralisation of health that we've heard about and shame and blame discourses um, that are being kind of perpetuated through the gamification of these devices. So this leads to a very problematic but fascinating area of digital health practice and it's the mediation of persuasive or coercive com computing and the governance of the emotional self. So these devices are capturing lots of different bits of information, but they can't actually capture the emotional activity or well-being, stress, trauma, or lack of context of a situation within, within these data capture devices that's completely omitted. So all human activity, physical, mental, and emotional, can't be fully reducible to datafication. And so we're limiting our definition of what needs scientific grounding and explanation if we're only able to do that with data that we are actually able to capture. Furthermore, a lot of these devices are, are not actually rooted in a lot of scientific rationality, so it raises a lot of questions about misinformation and what's being captured. So I would argue that these devices are not just about enlightenment through data, but that it's about information. What we need to examine is the information produced to change the way that users behaviour and under the understanding of the body is shifting because of these practices. So we understand that these technologies are challenging and shaping social values and meanings and our understanding of how we interpret the environment. And in this context, it's shifting these distinctions between the physical body, the data and the mind. It's constantly being renegotiated and it's shifting these normative definitions and understandings of what we consider a body and what we consider a person. And this shifts definitions of what we deem healthy as individuals and patients as well, as sufferers of ill health, in whichever capacity that might actually be determined with these devices. And one of my participants, when I questioned about, questioned about the acquisition of this data and any influence that that actually had upon their health practice, one of my participants responded by saying, it's interesting that something has forced me to take a look at my life. I don't know if it'll stick because my attitude is sort of I eat and I drink what I want. I do exercise to sort of balance it out. And so within this self-quantification, we're capturing and sharing content based on what we deem what the corporations or what the state deem falls within these above categories of importance. And so from this respondent, we are reminded that data isn't neutral and it is selective about what is and is not captured. And data scientists are storytellers. They are interpreters and they're taking slices of information from the data sphere and translating it into something for us to consume that's meaningful. However we interpret that is, is another thing. And so when we're visualising our data through these different graphic design interfaces, it's problematic in that we're seeing it through this semiotic layer of representation that the data story is revealed to us, but obviously in a simplistic and sens sensationalist way. And so this digitalised reproduction may impact how biometrics are perceived for the user, but also in turn how this information is then internalised and acted upon. As Duffy articulates here, how do you summarise and symbolise without oversimplif oversimplification and distortion? And if our behaviour changes as, as a direct result of being nudged by a design driver, what does that actually mean for how we're responding to that device? And if we look at it within a kind of wider socio-cultural and political context, it leaves a lot of ethical implications in terms of the motivations behind the design of these, of these devices. So we understand, we've spoken, we've heard briefly this morning about health gamification and this is a helpful way to kind of understand the, the game we're playing with this data, I suppose, how we're acting upon, what we're doing with it. 
you know, we're incorporating all these health practices into uh, play-by numbers on leadership boards and badges and um, comparative charts. And it's all becoming a form of health strategization where users of digital health technology and social media platforms are gaming to self-survey health behavior. But the game we're actually playing is about our body and it's play by numbers. So we're playing these constant games about our human capability and understanding it as a form of self-governance through the feedback loops that are actually being held within, within these devices. And it's a management and an enactment of self-governance to manage the health, potential health risks that we may be encountering. We do escape into games, as Whitson argues, but we also exercise our hyper-rationalised mind into managing actuarial risk. In this regard, we understand health as something that needs to be managed and maintained through consideration to risk of ill health, disease, and ultimately death. But the gamification of health can be understood as both tools of play and health management, but also these kind of considerations towards extending mortality and preventing death. And when I questioned one of my participants about the role of data and gameplay in motivating health decisions, they responded by saying, it is very measurable. You, so you feel like you're achieving things and it doesn't make you feel better. I guess being able to track stuff does help because you can look back and see what you've done and know that you'll be able to do it again. And what we understand from this is that we, this user knows, this runner knows that she's able to go and do that health practice again and again if she so wishes. But it's the acquisition of that data that kind of legitimates it for her and her mind and makes her feel that she's able to actually then go back and do this again. And so we can understand through Olivia Banner arguments around this organising of identity through discipline and regulation of the body, how it can be very self-empowering in this regard. But it exemplifies the status we're placing on data over human sense and intuition. Sociality is often felt through... Sorry, self-achievement is felt through the self-evidence of data, like sociality is often felt through the uh, representations enabled through social media. So just as to kind of sum up, the, my lasting kind of questions and thoughts at this stage are, does acquisition of data mean better health outcomes or health optimization? And what is all this data doing for our health practice and self-knowledge? We understand that it's a hugely important area and argu arguably problematic aspect of digital health devices, which does need addressing. But if our behaviour is changing as a direct result of being nudged by a design driver in response to wider socio-cultural, economic and political priorities and pressures, this leaves a lot of uh, this leaves great ethical implications in terms of the motivations behind the design. And lastly, this idea of personal discovery and natural revelation only being enabled through self-surveying devices and self-representational digital modes. And in this regard, it's data acquisition and the sharing of that data. What is this actually telling us about our health? Is it telling us anything more about our body and our health than we already know? Thank you. <laughs>